Hello and welcome. I hope you're doing well. Get cozy as I share with you some absolutely terrifying Sasquatch encounters. Now, before I start, I want to let you know that on this channel, I like to share encounters that are more of a slow boil, that tend to create an atmosphere and a mood. If you're a fan of encounters like this, be sure to hit that subscribe button and turn on the notifications. I post new videos every Sunday, Tuesday, and Thursday, and if you have your notifications on, you'll be the first to know when those videos go live. All right, let's get right into it. It was in July of 2015 when a couple of my besties and I were on a hike in Rocky Mountain National Park on our way to Dream Lake. We were about four hours into the trek and were following a meandering trail at some elevation, working our way around an enormous boulder. From our vantage point, Long Peak was visible way in the distance. To our left and falling away from the trail was a slope covered in some grass, brush, and small pointed pines of many shapes and sizes. As we had just made it around this large boulder, there were several other smaller and flatter rocks that seemed to be inviting us to take a break, and so we did. The trail here almost gave the appearance of a tan beach sand in contrast to the surrounding color palette. Just ahead of us, at a distance of about 200 feet, this tan trail wound around a bend and vanished from view. The three of us had chosen different spots to cop a squat on two different boulders. My back was to the view I just described to you because of where and how I chose to sit, as was my friend Kevin's. Bobby, however, chose to sit on a smaller boulder that was about 10 feet down the slope and was facing towards the direction of our heading. I was munching on a couple of packages of Belvedas and drinking some Gatorade when Bobby said, Hey guys, there's someone coming. It was about two seconds after what he had said registered in my brain that he then said, what the heck is that? Startled, Kevin and I quickly spun around. The three of us were now sitting with our collective eyes fixed on a large brown figure that had stopped dead in the middle of the trail ahead of us. Having just come around the bend, I guessed momentarily it hadn't registered in Bobby's mind that he was looking at a Bigfoot because we now were all too well aware of what we were seeing. The creature appeared to be equally as shocked as we were from the way it had suddenly stopped and stood there. It was staring right at us and began to rock from side to side. At this point, we had all gotten to our feet and were looking right at it. I think the distance was about 125 feet or so, if my memory serves me correctly, as we just faced each other off. What I'm about to say may seem really off the wall, but I'm going to say it anyways, because nobody will ever meet me and beat me up about it. In that moment, a deep sense of despair and loneliness started to overwhelm me. It hit me like a spiritual wave, and this feeling wasn't for us, but rather for this creature. I felt as though it was emotionally distraught and wanted to communicate that to us, but couldn't. There was absolutely nothing aggressive whatsoever about its posture or its actions, to me, it was just exuding sadness. What I did next, only a pet lover will understand, but I gently raised my hand and said, Hello there, we are your friends. I tell you the truth and no lie. In that moment, I didn't have an ounce of fear in me about this creature. I only felt sorrow, as though it badly needed help. No sooner 
Had I said this, then it raised its arms gently and kind of nodded its head, retreating back from where it had come. As soon as it had moved out of sight, my friend Kevin, not knowing how or what I was feeling, said, That was awful. I asked, What do you mean? He said, I felt like I was at a funeral or something. It was like a heaviness was all over me while that Bigfoot was standing there. I told him, I can't believe you just said that because all I could feel was a sadness about the thing and you confirmed it with your own lips. He said to me, yeah, man, it was like it just wanted to talk to somebody and was even more upset that it couldn't. We all slowly walked up to where it had been and could actually see it walking back down the trail. As we stood watching, it turned its body one time to look back at us and disappeared. When I say disappeared, I'm not talking about around a blind corner, I'm talking about it vanished, like now you see me and now you don't, if you catch my drift. The three of us stood there looking at each other and at the trail as if to say, did we just see that? Yet we just had. I looked down at my feet and could clearly see the prints of what would have been a large human-like feet in the sandy surface of the trail. This being that actually had substance to it, having left tracks, had just vanished before our very eyes. I have no explanation for what I have conveyed to you, nor will I attempt to rationalize the event in any way, shape, or form. You can simply accept or reject it entirely, and I will understand. As the creature stood in the trail at a fairly close distance to us, it seemed to be almost seven feet tall and its shoulders twice as broad as the trail, being some four feet or so. It had simply come to a halt upon seeing us and was gently rocking back and forth from the waist up. The hair was somewhat long and brown and I could see the skin of its chest through its fur. The skin on its face looked like a weather-beaten dark gray color. The hands were the same. How is it that something that has form and shape and function can just disappear is beyond me? I really don't expect anyone to frankly believe me, yet I have told this story again and again and now I have told it to you. On to the next story. If you hang around the Sneffels Range of Colorado's San Juan Mountains very long, you'll hear people mention the Blue Lakes Bigfoot, or maybe you'll meet him yourself. This thing has scared hikers, climbers, and backpackers in the area for many years. He's a legend by now, although it's all word of mouth. The local tourism people will tell you it's a joke as they don't want people being scared away, but I know it exists. I know because I saw him. My name is Dennis and my story happened about five years ago. My brother Kevin and I had been wanting to climb Mount Sneffels for a number of years, but we never could get everything together to go do it. Seems like there was always some reason we couldn't. We were both in high school at the time, and this 14,150-foot peak was right in our backyard, almost as we lived in Ore. It was kind of embarrassing to tell people we were climbers from Ore and had never summited Sneffels. Finally, one beautiful summer day, we headed up to the base of Blue Lakes Pass to climb, and we chose the longer one, simply because the other route from Yankee Boy Basin required a high-clearance vehicle, which we didn't have. We were driving an old Subaru and just getting it into the blue. We wanted to get up to the upper lake to camp, then summit the next day, camp below it again, then come back down to the car. It was a reasonable plan as the Blue Lakes route is longer and harder than the Yankee Boy route and camping at the upper lake would make the summit much closer. Mount Sneffels looms over the lakes reminding you what a fool you are to try to climb it. Blue Lakes are three glaciated lakes that sit like gems under Mount Sneffels, which is said to be the most photographed peak in the Colorado Rockies. It's 
very photogenic and spectacular, and the lakes are that glacier blue that comes from particulates suspended in the water. The lakes are high one above another, and you can't see all three until you're up above them looking down. And getting up high above them like that requires climbing Blue Lakes Pass, which is a narrow and exposed trail winding up the sides of a huge saddle that connects Mount Sneffels to Gilpin Peak, and that separates the drainages between Yankee Boy and Blue Lakes. That pass is scary if you're carrying a backpack as the trail is narrow and one misstep and you're going to tumble for a good 600 feet. We plan to turn at the top of it and climb Sneffels, then retrace our route. We would camp at the upper lake, leaving our heavy packs there. So we parked at the trailhead, got out our gear, ate some of the required gorp all backpackers carry, fed the chipmunks a bit, then headed out. We had plenty of time to lollygag and look around as the hike to the upper lake was a little over four miles and through a steep uphill at about 2,400 feet gain. We could easily do that and set up camp in a day. We would start at 9,350 feet and end up at 11,720 at the upper lake. We crossed the log bridge over East Dallas Creek, which was roaring from the late snowmelt, then headed up the trail. It took a while to get our second wind, even though we were in good shape, and were used to the high altitudes living and hiking around Ore. We took our time, and were soon at the middle lake, the smaller of the three, where we stopped and drank some power drinks, and then skipped rocks across the powder blue waters. The lake sits in a huge cirque, and there is snow coming right down into the lakes up on the other side, up against the mountain scree flanks. It was so beautiful, we talked about camping there, but we knew we'd pay the price the next day if we didn't carry on up to the higher lake. After a half hour or so, just long enough to lose our momentum, we put on our big backpacks and resumed our trek. Now, the trail skirted around the side of the lake and was consistently steep, whereas before it had been steep in spurts. We were soon winded again and had to go slow. We climbed high above the second lake and had tremendous views of it and the flanks of Sneffels. We were now above Timberline, and the trail finally leveled out into a rich carpet of alpine tundra dotted with wildflowers of every description. We were high in the upper basin, a meadow surrounded by 13,000-foot ridges that were punctuated by Mount Sneffels, Dallas Peak, and Gulpin Peak. It was a tremendous place to be in the true sense of the word. We were the only ones there, and we just sat down for a while, basking in the solitude and beauty. We arrived at the upper lake, then decided to hike a bit away from it, up into a higher plateau at the base of Blue Lakes Pass, which we could now see crisscrossing the ridge high above us. For some reason, it looked foreboding. The peaks above us also looked foreboding, with their jagged, rugged pinnacles and volcanic spires. The San Juans were created by volcanic forces, and here one could really see the black rocks and serrated ridges. We dropped our packs at what looked like a good place to camp, a small, wide hollow filled with columbine and shooting stars and daisies. I hated to even put my pack down for fear of smashing a flower, but I finally found a place where it was all tundra right by the trail. Kevin set his tent up by the trail also, but a little ways away from mine so my snoring wouldn't bother him. It was now early afternoon and we were hungry, so we took out bread and peanut butter and jelly and made sandwiches. While sitting there eating, we noted that wispy gray clouds were beginning to curl around the big peaks above us. It would be wise to set up camp now, we decided. The weather forecast had been generally good, but we were now in monsoon season when the afternoon thunderstorms would come rolling through. Our little backpacking tents were soon up and fatigue hit us hard. We crawled inside, intending to take a little nap. Altitude does that to one, makes you really sleepy from a lack of oxygen. 
I don't know how long I slept, but I awoke to a crack followed by booming thunder, and I jumped up, sticking my head out of my tent flap just in time to see a marmot dragging our loaf of bread away at breakneck speed. I knew I should run out and get it, as we hadn't brought a second loaf, but I was too scared, as just then another bolt hit a small spire in my line of sight. It was a huge wide bolt, and the thunder was deafening. There we sat in our tents, right in what looked to be a major lightning storm. The San Juans have a very high iron content and are like a magnet for lightning. The most spectacular lightning I've ever seen has been in the San Juans, and I've done a lot of traveling, including spending summer in Tampa, Florida, the supposed lightning capital of the world. I think the San Juan bolts are much bigger, at least they look that way. And it's truly terrifying to be that exposed in a storm with nowhere to hide. The thunder just echoes forever off those high peaks. I yelled at Kevin, but he seemed to be still asleep. I decided if he was tired enough to sleep through that kind of racket, I'd let him sleep. Crack. Another huge bolt hit, but now nearby in the meadow, I counted to two before the thunder started. That was close. Five seconds was a mile. As much camping as I've done, I've never figured out if you're safer in or out of a tent. I just sat in my tent, hoping the poles wouldn't act as lightning rods, looking through the flap. It was getting darker by the minute as huge black clouds moved in. I could see blue lakes pass from inside my tent, and suddenly movement way up on the upper pass caught my eye. Oh man, Someone was up there, right in the thick of things. Poor guy, he was sure to get hit. I watched as he came down, the first switchback, boom, lightning strike not far from him. I expected him to crouch down, which is what's recommended when caught in lightning, but he just kept coming down the path. It looked like he was carrying a huge pack. Just then, Kevin came tumbling into my tent. He was now wide awake and terrified. He really thought we were going to die up there, and to be honest, so did I. I pointed out the figure on the path to him. Kaboom, more lightning. It was now popping around us everywhere. I've never seen anything like that storm before or since. And the hiker just kept coming down the path. We were sure... We were about to witness death by lightning, his and maybe also ours. Kevin remarked that the hiker's stupidity to keep going and not crouch down, but I said I thought that his odds were better once he got off the pass, so that maybe he was doing the right thing. Of course, it's just a matter of odds anyway when you're in a storm like that. Now, the sky was about two-thirds down the pass, where we could get a better look at him. For some reason, it only then struck us that he was coming down at a tremendous speed without actually running. We found this weird. How could he get down the path so fast without running? Now Kevin was getting nervous. He pointed out that the guy wasn't carrying a pack, but was just really huge. What we thought was a pack was his shoulders and head. We watched him carefully, and as he came closer, sure enough, we could see clearly that he was a really big guy. More lightning, not far from him, but the guy didn't even pause. He just kept coming down the switchbacks, and now we were beginning to make him out better. His arms seemed extraordinarily long, and they hung way down, almost to his knees, and his stride was huge, and now we could see he was in all black. He had very muscular legs that looked like a football player's. We both were starting to get the creeps. This was no fellow backpacker. This was something out of our range of recognizable reality, and we were camped almost on the trail. It would soon be coming right by our tents, and there were no trees to run and hide in. Nothing. Now, I looked towards the motion towards the lake, and what I saw was almost as scary. A huge sheet of white was coming at us at a rapid clip. I yelled to Kevin, and we both bailed out of our tents, grabbed our packs, dragging them into our tents. 
Kevin zipped his tent up and rejoined me and mine. He didn't even have time to get his jacket out before it hit. Torrential rain. I zipped up my tent flap to keep us dry, no idea where the big black creature was now, and pulled my wool sweater out, giving it to Kevin while I put on my jacket. I wondered where the big black creature was going. It blew and poured and popped, and I thought we were going to die for sure, but my little tent held up. The rain eventually stopped, and by now, it was almost black outside. It was so dark. I finally stuck my head out of the tent flap to see what was going on. I couldn't believe my eyes. It was snowing. That was the final straw. We decided to bail and try to get out. We had no idea where the black thing was, but we had to get out. We quickly rolled up our little tents and stuffed them into our packs and headed down the trail. It was only about four in the afternoon, but the dark clouds made it seem like late evening. The trail out was slick and treacherous, but at least it wasn't exposed, so we were able to make good time slipping along in the snowy mud. The huge nearby cliffs had waterfalls pouring off them, a sight I've never seen before or since. It was awesome. We got down to the middle lakes when we came upon the tracks. The snow had turned into a light rain, and there in the mud were huge, five-toed tracks heading right down the trail ahead of us. Kevin put his boot into one, and it easily engulfed it. I can tell you that this really terrified us. That thing had walked right past us, and now we were behind it. We just stood there, not knowing what to do. It was still a good hike back to the car. What if we ran into it? Kevin was now shivering, but I wasn't sure if it was from the cold or from fear. Maybe both. I told him that whatever it was, if it wanted to harm us, it would have done so when it came by us in our tents. It could have easily killed us both right there and then. This seemed to help some, and we started down the trail, though a bit slower and more warily. It didn't seem to take us long to get back to the car and stow our packs away. The sun was out now, and we wondered if we'd made the right decision coming out and abandoning ship. We sat there a while talking about everything when what we heard next made us certain our decision was the right one. Not far away, we heard a loud hoo-oot, hoo-oot, followed by the same but from behind us a ways. These were not owls, but the voices of something larger than us, something completely at home in these extreme environments where we occasionally tread, calling it adventure, then going home to our safe houses and towns where everything is controlled. Out there, we're no longer the omnipotent ones, even with our equipments and guns and high-tech survival gear. We're nothing compared to those great beasts who live at ease in the harsh weather like what we'd just been through. It was time for us to go home and leave this place to those who belonged here. We heard an eerie howl as we got into the car and drove away. I hope you enjoyed those stories, and if you did, be sure to hit that subscribe button and the notification bell. I post new videos every Sunday, Tuesday, and Thursday, and if you have your notifications on, you'll be the first to know when those go live. Again, thank you so much for watching the video, and until next time, bye!